Welcome back to our study of Romans. If you've been alive for any length of time, you've experienced death, no doubt. Whether it's an animal as a pet or a family member or a loved one, seeing life leave someone's body is a miserable feeling. Seeing someone suffer with illness is a desperate feeling. But Paul has presented news, news of a Messiah, now here in Jesus. He is a king with authority over illness, death, and sin, which is really good news for all humanity because no one has lived up to God's standard of right living, and the penalty for violating God's standard is death. Everyone sins, everyone dies, for the Jew and for all the world. But is that it? Is that the end of the story? What a sad ending life would be if we lived, we died, and that was it. Well, here comes Paul to tell us the true meaning of Messiah is Savior. This is Romans chapter 3. We have to take a moment to think about God as holy, set apart, supernatural, otherworldly, extraterrestrial. Now, sin and death have no place with a holy God. Imagine for a moment an illustration of God's holiness being like the sun. The sun gives life. The life energy the sun gives is light. We eat sunshine. How, you ask? Well, all life on earth is generated and sustained by the sun. Plants use photosynthesis from the sun's light. And all living creatures are dependent on eating plants or eating plant products or eating other animals who eat plants. So the sun's light is sustaining all life. Even the heat that keeps us warm is some form of energy that's come from the sun, like firewood or fossil fuel. But the sun is intense. The closer you are, the more intense. And if you get too close to the sustaining light of the sun, you'll burn up. Like Moses, when he encounters God in the burning bush, don't come any closer and take off your shoes. Show some respect. This is holy ground you're standing on, Moses. You can't see me or you will die, God told Moses. Coming close to a holy God is dangerous because the, the holy righteousness is a refining fire that exposes unholiness and sin. Only once God told Moses... The only way you can see me is if I stick you in the cleft of a rock and then pass by so you can see me after I pass, or else you would drop dead. Now, priests couldn't even enter the temple, the dwelling place of God, without being ceremonially pure. And God's holiness is represented as a purifying coal in Isaiah 6.6. 6. Like the sun gives us life, this coal purified Isaiah's lips, regenerating and redeeming life, saving us from death. In Ezekiel 47, God's holiness is represented as a flowing river that purifies everything. And everything that comes in contact with this purifying river will live. In fact, where the river of living water flows, fish can flourish, the fruit of the land grow, and the land itself is restored. And Jesus said, I am living water. How will God purify an impure world without burning it up? God is going to replace this reality with a new heaven and a new earth. But first, God planned a rescue mission for his repenting sinners. And the answer God provides is propitiation. To understand this concept, we might think of a court of law, a cosmic court of law, so to say. 
Imagine at the end of your light, this cosmic court hearing, an arraignment of your case as a sinner before a holy God. In verse 9 of chapter 3, Paul will do just that. He will demonstrate Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And so the indictment, the, the formal charges, come in verses 10 to 17. No one is righteous, not even one. There is not one person fit to be in close relationship to God's holy righteousness. Consequently, the verdict in verses 19 to 20 is that the law makes us aware of God's holiness and the law makes us aware of our sinfulness, that we fall short. But the law cannot make anyone righteous. That's our will. The, the law only reveals what unholy, unrighteous sinners we are and how good God is in his mercy and his merciful gift through Jesus. Subsequently, Paul records God's solution in verses 21 to 25. The saving righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. When Jesus is my defense attorney, the verdict is acquittal. Humanity's choice for sinfulness and God's plan for his son, Jesus, to be our propitiation was not something God was surprised by one day and, and he had to dream up a rescue plan. God lays out his plan of punishing sin for, right from the start, from the beginning with Adam and Eve. God covers their shame with an animal hide in the first animal sacrifice where God spilled the blood of an animal. Read about it in Genesis 3. God also provided Abraham, a substitutionary sacrifice for his son, Isaac. Now, Abraham offers the blood of this lamb, which God himself provided in place of Abraham's son. And God's satisfaction for a restored relationship with sinners is through their substitution for God's own son. God's satisfactorily God's satisfactory punishment for our sins is on his son. His wrath is poured out at the cross. God can be just in this way. He's satisfactorily bringing justice as a good judge. And at the same time, the justifier, the one who pays the penalty of those who have put their faith in Jesus. Jesus is the propitiation of, atoning sacrifice. He is just, and he justifies. What the law could not do, Jesus did, as the fulfillment of the law. Jesus dies as the faithful representative of his family, Israel. Now, God's plan was rehearsed ahead of time, performed by the priests of Israel throughout their history, starting with Moses. Shown here is the most sacred part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, and the priest would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat depicted here. The sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat was for the forgiveness of sins. This was the rehearsal for God's plan in the final fulfillment in Jesus. What the Old Testament predicted, Jesus is coming. The New Testament fulfilled, Jesus is here. There was even a sign on the outer courtyard of the temple in every language saying Gentiles could not approach God any closer than this outer courtyard. With Jesus, Jew and Gentile approach God equally at the foot of the cross without restriction for the Gentile and without privilege for the Jew. Therefore, what advantage does the Jew have or what is the value of circumcision? What was God's point of revealing himself by calling his people, by giving them his law? Actually, there are many advantages. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jews procured the Bible so we could know truth. What then? If some were unfaithful, their unfaithfulness will nullify God's faithfulness, will it? Absolutely not. Let God be proven true 
and every human being shown up as a liar, just as it is written, so that you will be justified in your words and will prevail when you are judged. Quoting Psalms 51 here, uh, the law functions as a mirror for you to see your sin. Lust, pride, greed, and it's hard for most people. They, they would like to put the mirror back in the drawer and never take it out again. Most people avoid religion or the topic. They don't want to be convicted of the things they are doing wrong. As hard as I try, whatever I whatever works I try to do, the, the law cannot get myself clean. God sent Jesus to clean sin off our face. Only Jesus can wash me clean. I trust him to cleanse my soul. The law shows me the places I still get dirty so I can turn from sin, in, which is what repentance means. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I speak in human terms, of course. Is God unfair in punishing us for our sin? Well, if the law given to Moses and God's people didn't fix the world from the problem of sin, should we really trust God? After all, God made the law, but Maybe the problem is we just don't know how to view the law. So the law is not to see if God is good. The law is to show his good standard and how sinful we are. I will never see my own reflection by pointing a mirror in the wrong direction. And... It would only show I, I don't know what the mirror is for or how to use the mirror. Not that the maker of the mirror made a mistake in trying to give me a mirror to show my blemishes. So did God fail by giving Israel the law? Absolutely not. For otherwise, how could God judge the world? For if by my lie the truth of God enhances his glory... Why am I still actually being judged as a sinner? If my depravity shows the goodness of God, why should I be judged as a sinner by God? God made me this way. And why not say, let us do evil so that good may come of it, as some who slander us allege that we say, and their condemnation is deserved. Judaizers and critics are presenting a straw man argument here against believers in Jesus. They're saying that Paul and others preach, hey, do evil so good may come of it. They're intentionally mischaracterizing the believers in Jesus. Now today we see people mischaracterize Christians all the time as, as gay haters, as Islamophobes. However, Christians can differ with a person's expression of sexual behavior and still respect the person made in the image of God whose sexual behavior opposes God's design. Christians can reject a Muslim's idea about who God is without rejecting them as a person. In fact, engaging in discussion is caring about them as a person. Paul, in this letter, is sharing his knowledge about God by engaging the world in discussion. And we as Christians can differ with ideas, people's ideas or behaviors, and it doesn't let us love them as a person any less. What then? Are we better off? Certainly not, for we have already charged that Jews and Greeks alike are all under sin. Paul anticipates People will hear this message and say, oh, you Christians, you're, you think you're so good. You, you Jesus followers, you, you are so self-righteous, and we are so bad, right? Certainly not. Paul says, we Christians are sinners. We're hypocrites, just like you. Just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. 
all have turned away. Together, they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness, not even one. Quote, remember at the beginning of this chapter, Paul says, what advantage is there to being a Jew? Then Paul answers and says, well, for one, Jews were the curators of God's word, the Tanakh, which points us to Jesus. So how would we point out Jesus? How would we know Jesus without the Jews, the law, the Tanakh, that tells us who Jesus is? Paul, being a Jew, is laying out a demonstration of what a privilege it is to be a Jew and know the word of God. Quoting Psalm uh, 14 here, we are going to tour the law, the prophets, and the writings. Paul is going to quote what he has as, the old te- as our Old Testament over and over. Their throats are open graves. They deceive with their tongues. The poison of asps is under their lips. I didn't know what an asp was, that, but this is what it is. It's an Egyptian cobra. And you might think of the cobras that bit the Israelites, uh, and they were saved by looking on the serpent that was raised on the stake, uh, symbolizing our sin and Jesus' propitiation, atonement, sacrifice, atonement. It's a small southern European viper with an upturned snout. That's what an asp is. And Paul, again, is quoting the writings in Psalms 5 and Psalms 140. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Psalms 10. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths, and the way of peace they have not known. Isaiah now. Now the prophets. Isaiah 59. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Quoting Psalms 36. Pride. Vanity. This is our human condition, and our culture celebrates pride. And self-reliance is seen as a good thing. Dependence on God is seen as weakness by those who are perishing. But look at God's truth here in the writings. An evil man is rebellious to the core. He does not fear God, for he is too proud to recognize and give up his sin. Have you ever known anyone that was reluctant to admit they were wrong? Now we, now, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Oh, I'm not religious. I, I went to church once. I, I checked out Christianity. It's not my thing. Well, this doesn't give us that option. It says the whole world will be held accountable to God in that cosmic court hearing. For no one is declared righteous before him by the works of the law, quoting Psalms 143, for the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law is like a mirror. Israel sees the law and sees their sin and knows how righteous God is. He is the objective standard of good, giving a good moral law. Even Gentiles know right from wrong. And by following what is right, they acknowledge the law is good. So they know their sin by their conviction and their conscience. And so apart from Israel's failure at following the law, the moral goodness of God has been shown to all the world. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. Although it is, the righteousness of God is attested by the law and the prophets. So the good and just nature of God is attested to by the law, namely the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Remember, the, the law is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And the, the, the law is also the story of Israel. 
bringing forth Messiah, Jesus. Now, Paul, that is Paul's Bible, our Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the, the writings. And Jesus, when Jesus comes, he refers to the whole Tanakh as the law and the prophets. And this is the, the whole Bible before the New Testament. All the things that Paul is referring to and letting Scripture interpret the truth of his witness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God publicly displayed him as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood at the mercy seat accessible to us through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. So the blood here we've talked about in the opening is the typology, the mercy seat, and the priestly sacrifices, well, they foreknew the plan of God and Israel was, was fulfilled by the, the ultimate high priest in Jesus in sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. So this, this statement here, God passed over the sins previously committed. Well, instantly, God passed over would bring the, the image to mind for the Jews reading this letter of applying the blood having the Israelites having faith in God's plan given to Moses, which he told the, the Jews, sprinkle the blood. This will keep you, this will save you. This will save your family in their dwelling as the angel of wrath passes over. That is the feast of Passover. And so this was also to demonstrate his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who lives because of faith in Jesus. How do you justify your existence? Is it through affection? You need your boyfriend's affection so you'll sleep with him? Or is it knowing something more than others? Is it producing? If I just do this thing today, then I will feel good about myself. Is it earning money or winning? Impressing others with your degrees or your position, popularity? Is it helping altruistic things even, raising children? If my kids are successful, well, then I will feel justified. How does God justify sinners? This sprinter, Harold Abrams, tried to justify himself in the 100-meter dash. He said, I had 10 seconds to justify my existence, to make the world look at me and say, I matter. But God justifies sinners by Jesus. And when we see God's identity of us in Jesus, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what principle? Of works? No, but by the principle of faith. Something we do, like religious acts, are not going to justify sin. Faith in trusting the just justifier and what he has done will overcome sin. For we consider that a person is declared righteous by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since God is one, he will justify the circumcised, the Jew, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the Gentile, through faith. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. Instead, we uphold the law. Is the Old Testament irrelevant because of faith in Jesus? Absolutely not. Jesus can only be understood by knowing the Old Testament, which was preserved, curated, 
and passed down and quoted multiple, multiple times by Paul here, by the Jews. So God can be known by his word, the law, the Tanakh. God is the source and standard of fairness. Israel was given the law, and when Israel looks on the law, they see God and his justice. But even though the Jews were given the law, they didn't follow it. We all reject God's truth and ignore justice. We rebel against God's law, all of us. We aren't fair. We don't even try to correct unfairness when we see it. Does this mean God is unfair? Absolutely not. In fact, when Gentiles who don't have the law are convicted and obey the law because of their conscience, even the Gentiles know God by knowing his moral law, by following his moral law. They show they trust God is fair and just. So faith is trust in depending on God's word as truth and the fairness of God's character for the Jew or the Gentile. We know God is just. And the word of God has come to the world in Jesus, the justifier. 